What is going on, everybody? This is James Krasnerik live here for another live edition of Real Steel Sports on Spreaker Web Radio. Before I do get started on my review of Week two, Week 10, 2014, the NFL season, I do feel there's something I need to say. I would like to say thank you to every single member of the armed force that have fought lived, sacrificed for their lives so that I can live in a free country. We would not be a nation without you. We would not be the United States of America without you. We are eternally grateful and eternally thankful for all the work and the sacrifice you have put in. We are forever in your debt. And it still pisses me off today that Congress can fund more people to more troops to go to Iraq but in Afghanistan and whatnot, but when they come home they don't want to take care of them. But that's a different story for a different time. Starting off with game one, which was Cleveland and Cincinnati, I was really surprised at Cleveland going in there and just manhandling the Bengals. And Andy Dalton's career worst game of 10 of 33 for 86 yards and three interceptions in his fourth year now. Do you think at this point maybe the Bengals want to start looking for a different quarterback? I mean, Dalton's got a is a perfectly good quarterback. Don't get me wrong, he's not broken. He's just not as good as they thought he was going to be. I mean, you look at the contemporaries that came out that year. Um, two, what was it, 2011? Shoot, who was... Oh, yeah, Cam Newton was one of them. I mean, looking at everything and how it played out, I got to say right now that, you know, Dalton's a good quarterback. But in reality... The Bengals, I think, are still very, very much a handicap football team. And I think that <coughs> pardon me, still kind of boils down to their head coach. And the fact that they are still, in my opinion, mentally not all there. And I don't think Marvin Lewis has ever mentally been all there. He's had some great years, and he's turned some bad teams into some good teams. And he's made the Bengals a consistent playoff team since his, ten, in his tenure there. Something that not even the great Sam Weish or Paul Brown could do. But still, they're mentally not all there. Falcons and Buccaneers, a showdown of the two bottom dwellers in the NFC South. This was not really a compelling game. 27-17, Atlanta won over Tampa. Um, Atlanta finally getting a win away from home. I was going to wonder how long that was going to take. But in reality, it really doesn't matter so much at this point because they're 3-6 and six right now. I know the division's still a play, and they're only a game back of the Saints, and I believe then they, they could still catch up to them. But they still got to go to New Orleans. And I don't like the idea of that matchup for them because of the fact that in the Superdome, Drew Brees historically has torched the Atlanta Falcons. The Buccaneers, on the other hand, you know, Mike Evans was turning into a hell of a find in the draft this year, the young wide receiver out of Texas A&M. But other than that, really not a whole lot to be excited about. Chiefs and Bills, a very competitive game up in New York. The Chiefs, of course, rolled in there and won 17 to 13. Jamal Charles at 98 rushing yards. Both of these teams are very good teams and teams that could make the playoffs. But I give a slight edge to the Chiefs in that regard because of the fact that I think they've got a superior defense in general and that they do everything better than Buffalo does. Also, I think Al I think um, having Alex Smith at quarterback is a big plus because. He is able to take a lot of pressure off Jamal Charles, something that previous quarterbacks like Matt Castle and you know, some of the other guys, the also Rams that, that, that played in that position for a time being, they couldn't do. Dallas and Jacksonville, nothing really compelling about this game. Dallas rolled in the rolled in, in the London to take on the Jaguars, they improved to seven to three by winning thirty one to nineteen. Ultimately, what I feel is that Dallas is peaking at the right time, and having Roma back is huge because they've got five more games to go this year. They got six more games to go this year. And let's put it this way, with Arizona now lacking their starting quarterback and Detroit, you know, not still being, I think, a contender in people's minds, Dallas is not Dallas is not out of the question for getting, being a contender to win the NFC. They're really a really good team. But we'll have to see how they play down the stretch because they've collapsed in the past when people thought they were going to do well. But here's the thing about this game. Romo came back, looked superb, Des Bryant was unstoppable, and DeMarco Murray tallying another 100-yard game this year. 
phenomenal effort by those three guys. Another Holy Trinity, another Trinity down in uh, Texas. Oh boy. Speaking of Detroit, them hosting Miami was one of the more entertaining games of the weekend. They're having to go down the field and get the late touchdown pass from Tony from uh, Matt Stafford with less than a minute to go. There were some big plays in this game, like the Calvin Johnson touchdown was a hell of a catch, but the Brent Grimes interception in the end zone earlier in the game before the late before the late touchdown pass was just sick. I mean, he just put his one hand up there and just pulled it in right in front of Calvin Johnson. And normally nobody can really go up with Calvin Johnson and get the football, but he went up right in front of him and just took it. I haven't seen anyone do an inter pull off an interception like that since Antonio Cromartie back in 07 against the Colts. Look at that interception when he was playing for the Chargers. That was incredible. Another dull game in Baltimore is the Ravens. Uh, more or less put the Titans in their place 21-7. Tennessee got a touchdown to start, a pass from Zach Mettenberger to Leon Washington, but Justin Forsett and Joe Flacco kind of took over. Joe Flacco, not a really big game out of him. 16-27 for a buck 69 and one touchdown. Decent numbers. Justin Forsett, 20 carries, 212 yards and 112 yards, two touchdowns. Good game out of him overall. Thoris Smith finally had a good game this year. Five catches, 75 yards, and a score. So he's finally getting some productivity. Tennessee starting Zach Menberger. I don't think it's that bad of an idea because I don't think Jake Locker, I think Jake Locker, who is also a quarterback that came out with Dalton and Newton, I don't think he's proven he can be the guy. And I think until Jake Locker does, I think, you know, make him work for get his job back. Um, this game right here was a tough one to watch, New Orleans versus San Francisco. The Niners, of course, winning in overtime 27-24. i got to give credit where San Francisco where it's due. Ahmad Brooks, hell of a play in the overtime to force the fumble to get the, before the game-winning field goal. But no way, shape, or form should New Orleans have lost this game. And it has nothing to do with the push-off in the end zone. How the hell do you give up a fourth and ten and allow Michael Crabtree to get that right open? I'm sorry, but if New Orleans people, if people in New Orleans are, are singing for Rob Ryan's head, you know, for him to be fired for that job defensively, I can't really speak out against it because he kind of, sort of, maybe didn't play the right defense on that. But then again, he wasn't on the field. And he wasn't the defensive back that came up 20 yards and gave Michael Crabtree a half a field cushion. But yeah, it was an entertaining game. Again, New Orleans is starting to show some life now. As they are playing some good football. I know they're 4-5 right now. But right now, they've got plenty of potential and plenty of time left to get better. Mark Ingram had another solid day on the ground. 120 yards on 27 carries. Drew Brees completing 28 passes for 292 yards and 3 scores. But 2 interceptions proved costly again. As it so happens for the New Orleans Saints, they've been playing better defensively. They hit Colin Kaepernick four times, sacked him four times, and deflected five of his passes. They really were all over the field on this in, the, in this game. The, the linebackers and the, defense, the front seven for the New Orleans Saints, they played well. But all in all, San Francisco won this because I think they just had a little bit more metal left whenever the dust, whenever all was said and done. And Colin Kaepernick, I mean, his numbers may not be really impressive. He completed less than half his passes for 210 yards and a score. But he made the critical play when he had to. That that 51-yard bomb to Crabtree in 4th and 10, that was a ballsy play right there. And now for the game that has caused me the most discomfort. The Steelers and the Jets. Where do I begin? This was a brain fart. I was kind of expecting the Steelers to lose a game sooner rather than later after the three-game hot streak in which they blew out Tennessee, blew out Houston, blew out Indianapolis, and blew out Baltimore. But I did leave a little mis disclaimer that the Steelers in the past, just in the Tomlin era, have gone up to New York and struggled and have gone up against opponents they should beat and struggled. My opinion is this. I don't know if they went in the New York cocky, they beat the Jets, but I think they did overlook them a little bit. And I think the receivers, and maybe in their own minds, thought that they kind of had this one. Because the, the, the starting, the back four for the New York Jets, 
was about as unimpressive on paper as it, as it looked. And honestly, you give Peyton Manning a chance to go against that secondary in Denver, and he would have absolutely shredded them. I mean, now that Peyton Manning settled in, he, I don't think he was settled in when they played earlier in the year in the Meadowlands. But besides the point, three criticism from the Steelers in this game. Number one, they stuck with the run game way too long. I got to be perfectly honest. If you're down, what, like 20 to 3, I think? Yeah, 20, something like that. And you're still running the football in the second half. And you're doing it for like three yards a carry. What is the defense scared of? That you might run it for four yards a carry? At that point, you kind of had to go tell Ben. Got it, had to put it this way. Todd Haley should have gone up to him and said, Hey, we can't run anymore. Ben, go win the game for us. That's what they should have done. And I think if they'd have put the ball in Ben Roethlisberger's hands with a chance to win it, I think we'd have gone down and scored at least a couple more touchdowns than what we did. And I'll tell you why. The Jets' secondary is bad. Their pass rush is good. But the point remains the same. They were so horizontal. They kept playing the ball horizontal. The last three games, they've been throwing the ball vertically down the field, and it had been working. But we, but now in that game, they decided to go sideline to sideline. Ben's first like nine passes, he threw for like 16 yards. Like it was an extremely ridiculously low total. That's problem number one. Number two. The fact that they, the secondary of the Pittsburghs, the, the the run defense of the Steelers was just absent. I don't know what Dick LeBeau was trying to do. He should have stacked the box and forced Michael Vick to beat the Steelers. If he'd have done that and put the game in the hands of, you know, Troy Palmalu and James Harrison instead of trying to let old guys like Brett Keats and Cam Thomas chase down Chris Johnson and Sean Green, problem would not have been there, and the Jets would have had less trouble, less ability to run. And the final criticism I have is of the game of, is of not just the in in game game plan, but the game plan itself. That they wanted to throw more horizontal passes and try to work the ball down the field. When you have when you win three straight games in the National Football League, you don't change your style of play all of a sudden. The Steelers did, and it cost them the game. That's how it goes. The Broncos going to Oakland take on the Raiders. It was pretty interesting for a while. I mean, it was 10-6 Oakland, and then I think Denver actually started to try just a little bit as they would ultimately rack up 30. It would, they would outscore the Raiders 35-7 to the rest of the game. Peyton Manning, another five-touchdown performance. He played impressive. The Raiders are 0-9 this year, but, if, but there is a good silver lining for their, their uh, team. And that is, and in my opinion, Derek Carr is the, is the future of that franchise. Because here's where I made my decision he is the, the quarterback. His season, he's completing over 60% of his passes, 13 touchdowns, 9 picks. He's doing this again with an absolutely god awful football team around him. Like the Raiders are horrible, and yet they are still making. He is still making plays and throwing the ball and having some good games. I mean, he had four touchdowns against the Chargers. He played extremely impressive in that game. He's not a bad quarterback. I think the Raiders found their guy. Rams Cardinals sucks to see Carson Palmer get on the knee injury. I mean. Do I still have any hatred because he was a Bengal and the fact he was pretty, you know, harshful about the Steelers after the, they tore up his knee in the, the 05 06 playoffs? I'm not um, against the guy. I think that, you know, I think after a while he realized that the hit was unintentional. Kima von Olhoffen didn't try to take out Carson Palmer's knee. Watch the film, he didn't. But. It's just sad to see Eddie Wood get hurt because Carson Palmer's not a bad dude. I mean, if it had been Philip Rivers, I would have, of course, felt bad that anybody went down, but it may have been a little less sentiment towards his way, because I'm not a huge Rivers fan. But it's just sad because, you know, the Cardinals are starting to do good, Palmer's having an excellent season, and then all of a sudden it does that. However, I still do believe, even with Drew Stanton, they've got a really good chance to win games, because he's got a good offensive team around him, he's got a good offensive line in front of him, and he's got a good defense backing him up. They can win the NFC. It's not impossible. 
Speaking of winning the NFC, last year's champion, the Seattle Seahawks. Or should I say the Seattle Marshawns. Destroyed the New York Giants 38-17. That was an interesting game because it was close for a while and Odell Beckham absolutely made Richard Sherman like a fool half the time. Seven catches, 108 yards. He was pretty incredible and Richard Sherman's not used to having to guys do that stuff to him. But in hindsight, Russell Wilson played a decent game, 10 of 1717 yards. The two interceptions hurt, but at the same time, Lynch was key. 140 yards rushing, 23 receiving, 163 total. The guy was in beast mode again, and it showed, and that's the reason why Seattle won. The Sunday night game and Monday night games were, were massacres, for lack of a better term. Green Bay destroying Chicago on Sunday night. Expected. I was actually video chatting with one of my close friends who I do sports with. You might know his channel as YouTube channel is Quaman's Land, and he does all his Dragon Ball Z show, Dragon Ball Z videos that I've guested on. And we do sports, so sometimes guests with me. I was, we were talking about this game, and he said Chicago's got a you know good chance at least keeping it closer because of revenge. And I looked at him I'm like, no offense, dude, but I think Green Bay's gonna blow the doors off them, and I turned out to be right because no offense to him, but. Chicago's defense is actually that bad. In his defense, he did say Jay Cutler can put up some points against the Packers' defense because I think Green Bay's not all that good on the defense. But he's right. Green Bay's defense really isn't a sight to behold, but I think we're both kind of surprised that it was as one-sided as it was. 45 to 55 to 14, just absurd. Rodgers, another six touchdown game. at had six in the first half. But to be honest with you, I'm still not that impressed with his performance, and I'll tell you why. He did it against an absolute crapshoot defense. The two defenses that the Pitts, that, that Ben Roethlisberger went against were in the top 10 whenever he went against them. Chicago's defense is in the low 20s. It's not as impressive, and besides, he's played the Bears numerous times and knows how they play. But Ben Roethlisberger had never really played the Colts with their current core group of players on defense. New experience, still kick their ass. And Monday night, I was critical of Mark Sanchez when he was with the Jets. I made fun of him. I called him out for mistakes. In fact, I actually like to do something real quick. I believe I'm, on my time hop, I shared something because I have the time hop out on my phone. It links to my Facebook and whatnot. Two years ago, um, Sanchez's last season when he started for the Jets, I mean, he went 6-10 that year. Sanchez's predicted numbers over 16 games, 272 for 523, 3,307 yards, 18 touchdowns, and 6 interceptions. Now, a former friend of mine, who's a fan of the Raiders and Demarcus Russell, if you were to average out Demarcus Russell's best season over 16 games, he'd complete 30, 352 of 654 passes, 4,308 yards, 23 touchdowns, and 14 picks. So... Excuse me. You make an argument that Jamarcus Russell's best season was better than what Mark Sanchez had, and Russell's one of the biggest busts in NFL history. But back to Sanchez. Getting out of Philadelphia and going to play, getting out of New York and playing in Philadelphia might have been the thing that saved his career. Because the Jets, I always assumed that Mark Sanchez was an underdeveloped quarterback. Who came out of USC too early? They needed another year to mature. That wasn't ready to be a quarterback. And now that I've some, kind of seen enough of him, four or five years worth of playing, I disagree with that notion entirely, and I have to rethink my assumption on him. I think he's a guy that had he been forced to little, try a little harder early in his career, and would have been given the reins like Peyton Manning was, or hmm, or even a Matt Ryan, a Cam Newton, or an Andy Dalton, some of them on that line. I think he would have succeeded 
and I think even better, and I think the Jets' his rookie year could have maybe beaten the Colts and gone to the Super Bowl, and they might have been able to beat the Steelers in Pittsburgh the year after. What it boils down to is that he's got better receivers now, he's got a better team, he's got a coach who knows what the hell he's doing on offense, instead of acting like he kind of knows what he does on offense, because Rex Ryan's, not, no offense Rex Ryan, great defensive mind, idiot offensively. Hell, Chip Kelly's a decent defensive coach, because this Oregon defense is knew how to get after you. But anyways, Philadelphia looked so good. Connor Barwin, three and a half sacks, was just in, was beastly. And I'll say, to be honest with you, I'm not surprised at all Philadelphia beat them that bad. Because Carolina is proven right now they're not a very good football team. But for this week... I went 10 and 3 picking games, which isn't too bad. Uh, the last three weeks, I've gotten 10 right every week, and I'm doing fairly well. I'm now starting to get my bearings after struggling to start the season. I'll be back here probably tomorrow night after I get off work at 11. I'll probably do some previewing of the week 11 games. The highlights of the highlight games amongst those will be the Bengals at New Orleans, the Texans at the Browns to see if Cleveland can consolidate their huge division lead. The big one at one o'clock, Seattle at Kansas City. We've got a really good one on Fox in the evening game. This can be a really good one. We actually have two of them: Detroit at Arizona and then Philadelphia at Green Bay. And then we also have the Sunday night game, New England and Indianapolis. And then we have the Monday night game, Pittsburgh at Tennessee. I hope you guys enjoyed this, and please be sure to tune back in when I'm ready.